the thing I love about the guests that you're going to hear today is we can go just about anywhere and yet not meander very far. Um, we're in this podcast. You're going to hear talk about the Grateful Dead, Ayn Rand's lack of heart. Karl Marx, uh, shoe sales in Senegal, dimensions of uh, socialism, the dangers of presidential power, craft beer, marijuana, communist unicorns. I mean, it, this one has all of it, especially if you are looking for an understanding of what is socialism? What is capitalism? What does it all mean? by a guy who has started Free the People, a movement of libertarians that believe in the Constitution, and they're like conservatives, and, uh, and many libertarians as well are really missing the boat. Today, Matt Kibbe. You might have heard the controversy about the movie Unplanned. Uh, the MPAA in Hollywood gave it a rating of R, which was just a, an attempt to get um, Christians not to go, and... So you feel intimidated so you don't take your teenagers. It is so far away from an R rating, but it's not working. It's actually working in the opposite uh, direction with Unplanned, the movie that you have to see. People have been seeing it all across the country at record pace. This is blowing the doors off any, any expectation of this story. This is a true story about Abby Johnson, a woman who had two abortions, became the, the uh, employee of the year for Planned Parenthood. A year later, she was out, and one of their most powerful enemies. This story changed her life forever. This story will change your life. Go see it. Go to unplannedfilm.com, unplannedfilm.com. <laughs> You and I have known each other for a long time, and I hate to use this word, but it's gotten progressively worse in the nation. Things that we thought, oh, we'd never see, yep. never see. Things that were crazy to say 10 years ago are now being said every day by socialists. The media is trying to make socialists still into a bad word. They're saying, oh, the GOP is just going to throw around the word socialist. I want to spend some time with you on what a socialist is and all of the many dimensions of socialism. Is there good socialism? We know there's bad socialism. What's the difference? What's Sweden? What's Venezuela? And what are people really talking about here? Let's do it. Okay. Let's do it. So they say that they're talking about Swedish socialism, Canadian socialism. Yeah. But already their proposals are going f further than... Canada on just health care alone, Canada said that was unconstitutional. What they're proposing. Yeah, like they're, they're uh, it's fascinating to me that the modern Democratic Party has not only um, sort of allowed the S word into their mm. their vocabulary, but it's almost a litmus test now. Yeah, it strikes me that that um, everybody has to pledge some sort of fealty to this this idea of democratic socialism and, you know, in some ways they're chasing rainbows. They've seen AOC and, and, and yeah. how she succeeded on social media. Mm -hmm. And they, they think that, oh, let's go there. Let's do that. So, so part of it is sort of sig cynical virtue signaling and all of that kind of stuff. And, and, you know, when you talk to young people, they don't, they don't mean the kind of socialism that, that you and I know. So, so okay, so, 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 so tell me, let's start with the socialism that you and I know. Yeah. And the difference between what's what young people are gravitating to. So socialism, as as we understand it, means the government owns everything. The government owns the means of production. Right. And so it's a single top down, centralized, uh, centrally planned, um, not just economy, but world where where the smart people in power are going to redesign things, mm -hmm. presumably in a fair way. Right. Um, and, and from the top down, the, the, the way that that has manifested itself in history has been horribly brutal, right? Um, the best killing machine ever designed by man. And if you go back to Marx, 
And he has this, he has this, this sort of uh, determinist arc of history where he talks about uh, feudalism, uh, late stage capitalism, socialism, communism. And it's important to actually go back and read what Marx talked about because um, socialism is not the end. So when someone describes himself as a socialist today, I think, I think Marx would be sort of mystified because mm-hmm. the goal was not socialism, the goal was communism. Mm-hmm. But, but the Marxist philosophy and comments by Engels and Marx and certainly Lenin and the, the first sort of practitioners of mm-hmm. socialism, socialism was a very brutal, violent thing. It was where you took out all of the, the unfavored classes, you took out all the unbelievers, you, 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 you murdered them. And, and they talked about it as a fundamentally violent thing. We're going to have to reset society away from late stage capitalism where you have the division of labor and you have uh, work for wages and all of these things that are, that are really bad in the socialist ideology. Um, but the problem is, you know, people are used to that sort of stuff. So if they're not going to get on the team, we take them out. Mm-hmm. And so there, there's, a, there's a violence built into this, this theory of, of social change, starting with Marx. And, you know, eventually you get to this thing called communism that is, uh, you know, there's no longer prices, there's no longer money, there's no longer workers working for salaries, and, and there certainly aren't any capitalists, there aren't rich people that, that are lording over you. No, except um, there are. I mean, Maduro. I mean, he was a bus driver. Right. Now he's the wealthiest man in Venezuela, uh, and word is absconding with much of the gold. Uh, you know, if he's driven out, he'll take much of the gold, they, yeah. they believe. So there are, they, they may not start rich, but doesn't it always end with the rich people, with new rich people yeah. lording over everybody else? And that's sort of the dilemma. They have this sort of romantic idea that we can somehow eliminate power structures if, if we can right. just get through this brutal phase of violent socialism. But that's not how it works. And you know, one of the fundamental critiques of socialism, and I think democratic socialists are going to have a fundamental problem with this, is in order to redesign society that way, you have to centralize everything. You have to give somebody a lot of power. And, and Mandora is a great example of this. He, he is sort of the caricature of Hugo Chavez mm-hmm. in that, in the same way that, that you had Lenin and then you had Stalin. And it's not at all clear that, that Stalin or Maduro are sort of ideologically motivated people. They're just power hungry, mm-hmm. willing to do anything to keep power. And that, that's standard authoritarian stuff. You, you could call it socialism, you could call it fascism, you could call it whatever you like. Right. But whenever you concentrate that much power, um, there's, there is a rich guy, he's just not a capitalist, mm-hmm. he's a politician. Mm-hmm. And that politician is willing to do anything People will say that um, what Maduro's doing, that's not democratic socialism. Well, yes, it is. They voted him in. Yeah. Uh, and this is the way it always, you could have Jesus as the leader of your country and everything would say, fine. And if Jesus didn't happen to live throughout all eternity, you know, he died or needed to be replaced. It's the next guy and the next guy and the next guy that you worry about. Yeah. You know, what is, I, I, I warned Democrats on Obama, don't give him this much power because your guy's not always going to be in. Now they're screaming about uh, Donald Trump using much of the same powers that they gave uh, Barack Obama. And the Republicans, I'm warning now, your guy's not always going to be in. Don't give them this much power. Yeah. And so it was a democratic uh, socialist nation. It always, it, it seems to always end in the same way to where they just suspend elections or they make them so dirty that it's not a real election and that's who you have. You get like, look, at, look at the rise of Hugo Chavez and, and compare it to what's going on in the Democratic Party today and it's, it's chillingly similar because he was, um, you know, before he was a socialist ideologue, he was, he was, he was a populist. Mm-hmm. And he was appealing to the, the campesinos, the, the, the farming, working poor class in Venezuela saying, you're getting screwed. And, and frankly, they probably were because mm-hmm. the, the, the preceding regime was, was hardly free market capitalism. It was, it was insider cronyism, mm-hmm. cronyism, quite typical. So they were raging against the right thing, but the, but the alternative sort of populist 
democratic socialism, um, it it quickly devolved where where uh, Chavez accumulated more and more power and eventually suspended the constitution limits on himself and eventually nationalized the oil fields and, and the farmlands right. and, and all the things that, that you look at it today. Venezuela was one of the richest countries maybe even 20 years ago, mm -hmm. richest country in Latin America, and they can't feed themselves now. And they're sitting on all these oil reserves, but the lights just went out. It's a scene right out of, out, out of Atlas Shrugged. Yeah. You remember the, the yeah. end of this movie, right? Yeah. The lights go out. Mm -hmm. uh, Venezuela, richest country in Latin America 20 years ago, the lights just went out. Um, when you're looking at um, uh, things like uh, Venezuela and Hugo Chavez and you say it looks an awful lot like what's happening to the Democratic Party, how do you mean? Um, Appealing to the populist urges of, of, of sort of tax the rich at 70%, um, break, up, uh, break up the media companies, break up the energy companies, um, hold gun companies personally liable. All of that rhetoric mm -hmm. is sort of, sort of at its core, sort of anti-capitalist, mm -hmm. anti, I hate the fact that the means of production are in private hands because those guys will exploit us. Elizabeth Warren is talking about having the United States government make medicine. Yeah. I think that's the worst idea I've ever heard uh, for multiple reasons. But one, I, I, don't, I don't understand how the people who are for this think that the government is so bad, so inefficient, and it is, and then want to give it more power. They think the government is so dangerous. Donald Trump or Barack Obama is so dangerous. Let's give up our guns. Yeah. It, it, it just doesn't even make any kind of logical sense. It, and it's not logic, and I think um, I sort of learned the hard way as, as an economist by training, and, and I always, always wanted people to sort of think through costs and benefits and, mm -hmm. and, and perverse incentives and all Nobody that stuff. Nobody wants to do that. That's not how, I don't think that's even how people process information. No. I think we process information through our emotions and the emotional appeal of, of Medicare for All is that there's going to be health care for everybody. And, and that's important, right? right. Everyone should have health care. We are, we are, um, it is a, it, even if you take it to God, it is a godly thing to share your wealth and your bread. I mean, we're supposed to. That's what we, if you were raised in a Bible-believing uh, household, that's what you were ta taught. Share, yeah. share. But the difference between sharing and uh, socialism is the point of a gun. Yeah. I, I want to choose to share. I want to choose to be charitable. I want to help. And I want to find the things that I'm passionate about that I can help. And some people won't do it, but a lot of people will. And we've, we've crushed the soul of people wanting to help uh, and, and making it more and more impossible. You go back and watch... Uh Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's first video, the one that made yeah. her a viable candidate. And a lot of her rhetoric, she talks about dignity. She talks about how the people in Washington, the insiders, don't respect you. She talks about the collusion between big government and big business. And she talks about getting back to community and how we need to help each other, how we need a voice in the process, how we can come together and, and make things better from the bottom up. And all of that, I agree with. And that's not socialism. That's, that's right. precisely the opposite of that. So it's, to the extent that it's socialism, it's social. And, and you, you said it earlier, and, and this is fundamental, like compassion doesn't work at the end of a gun. Mm -hmm. You can't force someone to care about their neighbors. And to the extent that you've outsourced that to a third party, uh, a government, um, particularly a government that's far away, um, you know, people get, they start to get cynical. They start to get bitter and they're like, well, I, I pay so much in taxes. Why, why do I have to help again? Why, why should I do that? So I think, I think for, for people that are sort of attracted to that narrative, um, we, should, we should spend a lot more time explaining how it is that, that freedom actually works and how it is that free people do feel inability to cooperate and, and share their, their personal dreams and skills and knowledge and come together 
and create really beautiful things. We don't, we don't do that so much. So uh, I happen to believe, now I come from a different place because I come from a God place, and I know there's a ton of people that don't, and they, they don't think it's even necessary. And I know people like Pendulette. It's not. He just innately is this way. Um, but, uh, you know, I think Ayn Rand, I love Ayn Rand. I love what she says. I love the... The vision of the strong individual standing up. However, she misses that that point of heart. And so it seems so cold and distant. And really, I I think in some ways it is. When you talk to real people who are really diehard Ayn Randers, right. They're like charity is bad. Right. Yeah. And and I I I defend her and and she was very influential when I was a Mm -hmm. when I was a kid. I I discovered Ayn Rand reading the liner notes on a Rush album. So she, she, she was my first breadcrumb that led me to Adam Smith and the Austrian economists and all of that. And, you know, in context, it's important to remember that, that she, as a young Jewish girl, fled the Bolshevik Revolution. And think about the, the guts that that took. Oh, yeah. And, but also the, the, the permanent scars. Like, I had to leave my family and come to America and make it on my own. So a lot of her, when she talks about selfishness, mm-hmm. she, what she's, I think what she's saying is, I want to be myself. Mm-hmm. And I don't want some brutal government to tell me who I am. So if you try to, screw you. And, and, and a lot of her, her sort of, when she talks about selfishness and individualism and, and, and the rugged nature of, of people just taking care of themselves, it's, it's a reaction to really right. brutal socialist communist philosophy. Um, and, and I agree with you, a lot of, a lot of Rand fans stop there. They focus on that and maybe they're not, and we had this conversation once, maybe they're not reading the books the way I did because, um, I look at a lot of the heroes in both Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged as, um, people that care extraordinarily about society. Mm Mm-hmm. Like they're, they're bleeding a lot mm-hmm. to try to save mm-hmm. the thing that keeps the lights on, mm-hmm. uh, particularly in Atlas Shrugged. They're all, they're all just getting beat mm-hmm. up every day and demonized by everyone. Um, the threats, you know, the government comes in and, and confiscates their property and threatens them, and yet they, they persevere. That's not selfishness in any narrow sense that I would understand it. That's, that's doing something bigger than yourself. Well, I think it's... Um it's capitalism, we haven't done, would you agree, we haven't done capitalism for at least 100 years. Yeah. Okay, this is, this is a mess. A lot of the things that people that, that think that they are progressives, um, they think they agree with, it's actually, that's kind of the root of what we have right now. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's pulling away from the Constitution and the rule of law and the independence and the gathering of power in Washington that's causing so much so many problems. Um, but as you really look at um, some of these characters from Ayn Rand, and, but, but also go back to Adam Smith and moral sentiments, capitalism is the most compassionate when it's at its best. Yeah. It is the most compassionate, and it is the, it's the best way to do charity because it, 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 a good capitalist knows I can be a millionaire if I, if I design something that everybody needs once. But I can be a billionaire if I design something that everybody needs every day. Yeah. How can I make people's lives better or easier? If I can come up with that, well, I get the riches. But it's, it's like hunger. We have done so much to pull people out of starvation, to pull people out of... Um, uh, of um, uh, poverty and and you can't say that it well it was the big um, you know it was the big charities that did that it wasn't it was the idea that you're an individual and that you should be able to keep what you make and there's there's, there's a free market out there to exchange goods and services you put the iPhone and connect it to the internet in the middle of the jungle they're making money they're now making money and they have things that they've never had before, like clean water. That's not charity. That's capitalism. Yeah. But it's the best form of capitalism, is it not? Yeah. And I, you know, I hesitate to use 
the C word. And, and, you know, reportedly it was Karl Marx that sort of set up this false choice between socialism and who could be against being social versus capitalism, which, which emphasizes one small part of, of what a free market economic process is, the accumulation of capital. But that's not what freedom is about. That's, mm-hmm. that, is, that is a consequence and, and a useful tool by which mm-hmm. people can create wealth and prosperity and, and, and lift people out of poverty. So I worry about the, except it's sort of like I don't like the left versus right thing. Yeah, Are yeah. we really choosing between Hitler and Pol Pot? I don't think so. I think, I think we have to rethink these things. But, you know, I, I just, uh, this week on my show, shameless, shameless plug for, for Kibbe on Liberty, mm-hmm. uh, Maget Wade, who is a, a young entrepreneur from Senegal, um, she, if she was here, she would tell you that all of this charity that has tried to help, help Africa all these years has been a disaster. Bono says the same thing. Yeah, Bono says the same thing. Bono says that, that of all the isms, capitalism is the only thing that is lifting people out of mm-hmm. poverty in Africa. Um, and there is sort of this perverse incentive with the, the NGOs, the, the, the poverty industrial complex, call mm-hmm. it whatever you mm-hmm. like. Um, last thing they want to do is fix poverty. Mm-hmm. Then, then the business stops and, it, and it's over. And did, I spent some time in Haiti. It, it, we're actually doing real harm to Haiti yeah. um, where, you know, all the rice and all that, all of, all that stuff is coming in. It's coming in from charities, it's put, it, put farm farmers out. They're not growing anything. How could you possibly compete? I mean, it's, it hurts. Yeah. But you know, I, I had a, a, another progressive friend on the show and we were talking about the fact that capitalism is lifting all these people out of poverty. You know, the world bank, says something like in the last 30 years we've we've halved the number of obscenely poor people in the world and and by any measure that has to be a good thing but what progressives are obsessed about but is it equal is it fair is it just that in the process of doing all of this someone like Jeff Bezos is I don't know how many billion he's worth these days but he's he's worth a lot of money um, they don't like that. And, and I even look at the data uh, to take it a bit further. Like there isn't actually a trade-off between equality in terms of income equality and prosperity. Those things actually work and rise together mm-hmm. in practice. But again, that's a, we're making an economic argument. How do we feed people? We do it through, through free enterprise and, and taking that burden off of, of production of food and everything else. And the other side is making an emotional argument that it just doesn't feel right. I don't, how do you argue against that doesn't feel good? I think one way that, that I want to do it is we're going to go to Senegal and we're going to talk to people. And I want to, I want to, I want to sort of humanize the, the positive effects of what free market capitalism actually brings to that country, but also humanize the, the, the unintended consequences of, of charity and government regulation and all of these top down, the, the theme is top down, right? All of these top down good intentions never ever work out. But it, if, we're, if we're having an emotional conversation instead of an economic one, let's talk to people. Let's talk to a person that, that used to sell shoes and was devastated by a well-meaning shoe company that started giving shoes away for free. That person exists and he doesn't have a job anymore. And the person who gave the shoes away probably has no idea how much damage he did. Yeah, there's, there's no understanding of, of what Bastiat, you know, he talked about the seen and the unseen. The seen is, is making sure that, that um, kids in Africa in, in that village are receiving a pair of shoes. The unseen is that you just disrupted the informal economy that, that creates all the jobs and, and all of the means by which the people themselves could lift themselves out of poverty without a handout. The handout is, is corrupting and it, 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 it destroys the, the sort of institutional evolution that would allow people to help themselves. Mm-hmm. A lot of that has been lost. I mean, you know, um, even FDR said, you have to provide a man work if you just give him welfare without providing him work eventually. He'll, 
he'll just roll up in a ball. He'll be useless. Um, I mean, you know, the idea even of Social Security was that's for the people who they didn't retire. There was no retirement. That, that, that was two or three years after. 65 was two or three years after the average man died. So it was to take care of the widows that might live to 66 or 67. Now we're looking at it as a retirement plan. That's not what it was intended for. It was, it was social security, SSI, social security insurance. Yeah. So insurance, insurance is not guaranteed to pay out, but now it is. And we've lost sight of this was the safety net that we were supposed to provide. Yeah. You know, that we as a, as a, capitalist republic voted on and said you know what we we do have to take care of of some people we have to do that as a people well that's not what it is it's not what it that's not what it ever lasts as and this this is sort of the achilles heel the fundamental um fatal flaw in in the progressive dream which i I mean just to, to be like sort of intellectually honest i don't see a, a fundamental difference between progressivism as it was defined, and, and socialism, because the, the, it's all supposed to be top-down. Mm-hmm. It's supposed to be Autocratic. Re- replacing the, the chaos of the market mm-hmm. with the best people from the best universities and the best mm-hmm. families, very elitist. Um, it, you, you know this better than I do. Um, very racist at its, at its core. Um, but the thing that they have never been willing to accept, and, and all planners, all good meaning do-gooder planners they don't understand power and they don't understand how power corrupts absolutely and they don't understand how a program that might be strictly limited uh, when just a few people were living over 65 years of age as a as a small safety net how that took on a life of its own and how it became a political football Mm -hmm. and how it became a weapon for the bureaucratic class to use to build itself at the expense of people and all of those things, and, and even how it is that big businesses will game the system to make it difficult for mom and pop businesses to get a foothold in the market. All that stuff happens with every single government program. And you know, when it gets really bad, you end up with Venezuela. When it is sort of under control, you end up with $22 trillion mm-hmm. in debt. But you know, at some point, you run, as Mar- Margaret Thatcher said, at some point, Run out of somebody else's money. Yeah. Um, let me take you to. Um, let me take you out of these times because it's easier sometimes to see things when you're going back and talk about the past. We're living in a time much like the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, except it's going to be much more transformative, faster than that was. But you're seeing the Vanderbilts um, and the Carnegies. Um, they just happen to be the Bezos and the, and the jobs of the world or whatever. Um, and you're seeing this great wealth produced and, and you're seeing it even with, with Google because they have such great wealth and such great leverage. These companies are now the size of the, you know, governments, most governments around the world are not the size of uh, Google and Microsoft or Facebook combined. Yeah. Um, and so they have great power. You know, the, the Vanderbilts, they, they pretty much laid out where the train tracks were going to go because they own the railroads. And, you know, they wanted a house over here. That train was going that way. Um, uh, and when I first moved to Texas, I went in the air um, with Ross Perot. He's a neighbor of mine. And I went with his son and uh, he took me over this ranch that he had was tens of thousands of acres and he had slowly sold it off, but they had built an airport, built a train switching station, which all the trains used to be switched in Houston. They're now being switched here. He built this beautiful airport right next to it. So goods and services could be either offloaded on the train or onloaded um, onto the plane. Amazon just picked that as the head of Amazon flight operations. And as I was with him in his helicopter, he was pointing out all the different things that he did. And, uh, you know, he was like, and years from now, this will be this and that will be that. And I thought, this is how the rich get richer, really. They have enough money 
to be able to say, you know what? Put the freeway here. Yeah. And that's where real wealth comes from. How do you... I don't agree with the robber barons. Some of them were bad. Some of them were really good. But how do you uh, stop people from gaining Rockefeller-style power and wealth? Or should you? So I just had coffee with a uh, public interest lawyer in D.C., and he's an old uh, Ralph Nader Raider guy. And we were talking about this, this concentration of, I'm not sure it's concentration of wealth, it's concentration of power and how there is, um, there's, there's, there is an elite uh, group of insiders that know how to play the game. They know how to game the system. And it, it may not simply be um, you know, government insiders versus free market stuff, but I, I do think when you, when you dig into that stuff and, and you know, the stuff that Amazon is doing, the stuff that Google's doing, they, they have a lot of government contracts mm-hmm. and they have a lot of power in Washington, mm-hmm. D.C. And they very much are in the business of gaming the system mm-hmm. so, that, so that competitors can't do that. I mean, that's, I mean, that's what Ayn Rand r- wrote yeah. about. Yeah, like her I mean, whole book is really about public choice theory. It's really right. about um, eventually you got to get a man in Washington. Mm-hmm. And, and you see that evolution. You saw it in Microsoft. Mm-hmm. Microsoft was, was a functionally sort of libertarian corporation that didn't even have a D.C. office mm-hmm. until they got taken to the woodshed mm-hmm. with an antitrust suit and all their competitors piled onto that. Um, and they built up a, what is now a huge D.C. office. And now they use their insider connections to try to screw their competitors. Mm-hmm. So That's that, the problem. Yeah, that's the problem. And you, you need to sort of sever the cord between the accumulation of wealth because I, I, don't, I don't think you want to stop that because that's killing the goose that, that laid the golden egg. But how do you make it so that these very politicians that are, that are preaching to us about fairness and justice and, you know, Elizabeth Warren wants to break up, uh, um, is it Amazon? I forget. Mm-hmm. Like she wants to break them all up. Mm-hmm. Um, what she's really doing is sending a signal like, you got to play ball. Mm-hmm. Like, I want a piece. So if, if you come to the table and work with me, help me get elected, uh, donate to my campaign, um, I'll make sure that you have a seat at the table when we um, craft the plan to break you up. And, and over history, what happens is every time that process plays itself out, the, the so-called, uh, you know, the big business that we're setting out to rein in, they write the rules. And they rewrite the rules. Google wrote the um, uh, internet uh, bill, you yeah. know, for, for what, what is it called? Uh, uh, f- oh, shoot, it's not free internet, but uh, you know what I'm talking about. Um, they're the ones who, who wrote that bill. Right. Internet neutrality. Yeah, yeah okay. net neutrality. Net neutrality. I mean, that, is, that, that, that should make you stop and question. Wait right. a minute. Google wrote that? Yeah. You know, you saw this in the... Uh, in World War II and the Great Depression. I mean, if anybody looks up a visual of a cord, uh, C-O-R-D, or, um, or anything really that was built um, in, uh, in, I think, Indiana back in the 30s, as far as cars, you had the Duesenberg. Yeah. Those things were, at, those were outrageous great cars. The big three were called into the office because they had the clout. You guys make the rules uh, so we have a fair playing ground, and they did, and it put all of those great car manufacturers out of business and, because and, they write them for themselves. Yeah, and that's, that's the, the cognitive dissidence with, with someone like Bernie Sanders because, and, or AOC or any of these sort of populist uh, social uh, justice warrior types. They, I'm with them when they're raging against the machine. I'm with them when they talk about the collusion of big government mm-hmm. and big business. I'm with them when they complain about permanent war and mass incarceration and, and crony capitalism, all that stuff. But they don't seem to understand how power accumulates because of the very policies that they advocate and how mm-hmm. they, no matter what the program is, it could be social security, it could be Medicare for all, it could be net neutrality. There's always a middleman. There's always a guy at the table before you and, and the voter, the citizen, the consumer, 
you never have a seat at the table when the when the when the mm-hmm. pie is being divided up. Um, so I do think there's like part of the answer to the rise of socialism has to be what I would probably call um, libertarian populism. Like we need to acknowledge that there is a class of insiders and, and that class of insiders isn't just in Washington, D.C., but it's a, it's a mutual beneficial insider mm-hmm. club. Um, let, let's embrace that. I mean, that's what Hugo Chavez was railing against. That's what Bernie Sanders was railing against. But, but the, the irony with Bernie is, is like, that's why we need to give him more power. Because mm-hmm. if we do that, then they'll stop. I don't know. Mm-hmm. It doesn't make any sense, but we could appeal to um, sort of the emotions of people that know the game is rigged. They know the system is corrupt. They don't trust politicians. That's a very healthy thing. Um, let's, let's focus on that, and, but also get to that other thing we were talking about. What's the, what's the beautiful thing that's the alternative to this top-down uh, insider's collusion. What's, what's the beauty of the market? And, and we, we really suck oh, at explaining really horrible at it. The, the beauty that comes yeah. out of free people. So, so let's go there after one more question. Please tell me the difference between socialism, communism, and national socialism. So communist Nazis and just straight up, yeah. you know, Swedish socialists. Well, I'll use, um, I mean, communism is sort of this, this fairy tale world where there's, there's unicorns and there's, there's no more scarcity. So food's not an issue, housing's not an issue, healthcare's not an issue. Um, so it's very much a fantasy world. There's no government. In real communism, according to Marx, there is absolutely no government. Uh, there's no need to work. There's no need to uh, grow stuff. I don't, it, so it's like this, this fantasy world that, mm-hmm. that we're never going to get to because the, the, the gateway between capitalism and communi- communism is socialism. Mm-hmm. And that is, in, you know, in practice, it's some sort of, it's not all government control of the means of production. On right. occasion, they try it. Mao tried it with a great leap forward mm-hmm. and 65 million people starved. Mm-hmm. Brutal, brutal. Like uh, uh, Pol Pot in Cambodia, he, he studied Marxism at the best university in Paris. And he and his friends came up with this idea, this, this idea that we could move, mm-hmm. move society back to this agrarian state. And he implemented it with great seriousness. But the first thing he did was kill all the foreigners. Jeez. So what, what is that? Is that socialism or is that national socialism? Is that, that sort of that, that cultural identity that, that we often associate with, with Mussolini and Hitler? Um, in practice, they, they merge together. But you know, technically, socialism is, is government ownership of the means of production. Fascism is just government control of the means of production. Mm-hmm. In practice, a lot of the socialist experiments have had a- clear aspects of fascism and a lot of fascist experiments. Mm-hmm. I mean, both Mussolini and Hitler, you know, they were socialists before mm-hmm. they, were, they were fascists. But, you know, it... it certain- and, and, and Mussolini in particular was... Um, he, he, his problem with communism was he said, I, I, I fought in World War I and nobody was fighting for the workers of the world. They were fighting for France or they were fighting for Italy. Yeah. They were fighting for their homeland. And that's what brought him into national socialism instead of communism. Yeah. Uh, and the same thing with, with Hitler, with the, with the red on the flag. Hitler said the reason why the flag, the Nazi flag is red is to show that we are the same as the Reds. The, any communist, they need to know that's, that's our base, is, is that same basic philosophy. Yeah, and you know, we're still watching that play out today. It's, it's a sort of a cynical strategy of, a, of appealing to national identity mm-hmm. instead of class struggle. But you know, the, they'll throw it out there. Let's, let's see what sticks. Are, mm-hmm. we, are we mad at rich people today, or are we just mad at... at at people from, from another religion or another ethnicity. And with Pol Pot, it was all of the above. I'm going to use all of those demagogic tools to manipulate people and to scare people and, and ultimately to kill people. Um, it's, it, it, it sort of plays itself out today with Antifa. And, and you know the history of Antifa. 
um, it was this, this pissing match for power mm -hmm. back going all the way back to World War II between the communists, Antifa, same thing, and the fascists who were the other side. And by the way, the leaders of those two teams would switch teams on a strategic basis depending on, on who was winning and, right. and what was playing with the public, all of that stuff. Um, but it was never a fight about ideology. No. I, th I think it's a fight about power. Yeah, who's in control of it? Yeah, who's, who's, who's in charge? Um, and I, I see that today with, with the violent tactics. It's, it's an experiment to see if the American people will tolerate violence as a tool for political change. And certainly the, the media seems to be giving them a pass on that. Everybody seems to be. Um, all right, so tell me about the beautiful alternative because no one is communicating this. They're, it, everybody's talking about, well, we just, we just need to fix health care. We just need to do that. No, we, it's a big job ahead of us, and it's a bold vision, but I don't hear anybody articulating it. Yeah, and it's, it's hard to articulate a vision that essentially imagines beautiful things that, that people could do if they were left free. So I always start the conversation by pulling out this guy. Yeah. And we all know who came up with this idea. Um, and I, iPhone. And, you know, by all accounts, Steve Jobs was a total jerk. He's, he's rude and obsessed. And just I'm a, in his book, you know. Are you? Yeah, he tried to get me fired at Fox. He met with uh, Rupert, flew into town, met with Rupert, tried to get me fired. So you're not going to argue when I say that Steve was kind of a jerk. Steve is a genius. I actually like the stuff that he made. I don't know how he, become the, he became this beloved figure because he was one of the worst human beings yeah. that anybody knew. It's because people uh, left, right, center love the notion of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. What about Elon Musk? He's, done, he's not getting love. Well, he should stay off Joe Rogan, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> or at least have the pot stay after. Yeah, 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 yeah. Smoke after the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll work it out. Yeah. But, but I, I think you know this this device, and I and I go like because I'm a dork. I always go back to Ludwig von Mises. My wife hates me for this. She's like <laughs> nobody, nobody cares. But Mises talks about entrepreneurship. It's not just satisfying consumer demand. It's imagining an alternative future that's better, more awesome, and and part of his stubbornness jerkiness was forcing his colleagues to say this is what they want they don't know it don't go market test it don't tell me that it has to be this way i have this vision of a future and if and if you imagine like confiscating all the iphones today the, the millennial generation would would shut down they couldn't yeah. function you could you could seize all the guns you yeah. get rid of the first amendment second amendment they're not gonna say anything so how, they they like, would. Like, and, and entrepreneurship's not a dirty word. Capitalism is a dirty word with young people, but entrepreneurship isn't. And so what I've tried to do, and it's difficult with things like healthcare, but I've tried to use things like craft beer as a metaphor for the awesomeness that happens when mm -hmm. people are free. Because there's, in the craft beer world, there's, there's a, a sense of radical innovation. You know, you can make a triple IPA, quadruply hopped with, with hops from all over the world and it's 12% alcohol and it'll, it'll make you completely incoherent if you have two of them. <laughs> but it's sort of a quest for people to, to, to create that and see if there's a marketplace for it. There's, there's all of these sub-sub communities who get together and, and try to find the, the hoppiest beer out there. There's a sense of, of community at these craft beer places and it's, it's really a metaphor for everything we love about markets. Um, you have an entrepreneur, and he's not just trying to make a buck. He's trying to create something that he loves. He's mm -hmm. trying to create something that he wants his community to love. Mm -hmm. He's trying to serve an audience by doing something that he's not even sure they're going to want. Mm -hmm. And so finding stories like that, uh, we could find them in, in charity. We could find them in markets. We could find them in products and services. I think one way to explain the awesomeness of markets and how it produces community in a sense of, dare I say, social responsibility. Um, I hate it how the left steals all these words. So if I say social responsibility now, it's got all this baggage. Mm -hmm. Like I think there's such a thing as social responsibility. Oh, I do too. But it's not, no one's gonna force me to do it. So I think 
I think we struggle with that because it's sort of an imaginary future. You're looking around the corner of history and imagining a world where you could get health care like you get your Airbnb, mm -hmm. like you get your Uber. Mm -hmm. You could actually choose from a whole menu of doctors. You could look at their ratings. Mm -hmm. um, you would know what your pricing is before you go in. Mm -hmm. This, this is not... There are MRIs and yeah. CAT scans that are sitting empty. I want to book a CAT scan. Well, you can drive here and you can take that and they can compete against each other. And the free market works. The could, free market works. You could get rid of all the, the third parties and administrative hangers-ons. Mm -hmm. The money we would save by getting rid of all that. Yeah. And, and I think we need some some actual experiments. I know they're out there. I want to go find them and actually make some, some documentaries about, mm -hmm. about how free market medicine actually works mm -hmm. today. And, and tragically, it, it, today it works in, in what's called boutique medicine. Mm -hmm. So you have, you have centralized, government-controlled, heavily rationed, I can't get surgery in time for me not to die mm -hmm. type systems. And the market has responded by creating boutique medicine and who can afford boutique medicine? Mm -hmm. Only the rich. But you can at least see how it is that a yeah. market price would work for True. an MRI. You can't see it when you try to decipher your hospital bill or, or your insurance payment. It's just not there. There's no pricing. So when you, when you, look, at, um, when you look at, let's say, the market health care, um, people only see the suffering of others. And they... And they see only the option of, well, we got to repeal. And do what? And do what? What is it we're going to do? And I haven't heard anybody talk about the grand design and the beauty of a radically different healthcare system on the right. Yeah. It's going to, I mean, and I think for better or worse, all of the, the things that we've tried to fix. Um, you and I have been at this for a long time, and you know we we tried to fix the federal government. Yeah, and not going to happen. I feel sort of silly and naive now that I thought we could could elect a bunch of people that would want to balance the budget and all that. Mm -hmm. But it was a noble fight. Glad mm -hmm. we did it. Um, I think it's a different world. We we yeah we didn't understand what we were fighting, and um, and we really thought that there were decent people, and there are a few. Yeah, um, but. There's a there's a ton of cowards, ton of cowards in Washington. Ton of cowards, and and all of the incentives are designed mm -hmm. to grow the government, Washington class. I should call it the Washington class because it's not just people that work for the government. But I, I think, you know, and this is where this is where my libertarianism comes out. I, I I think that technology and entrepreneurship is going to hack the system outside of politics, the same way that boutique medicine is a market response. To the fact that people that desperately need health care can't get it waiting in line in, in the UK or in Canada. They, they get on their G5s and they go get it somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, there's actually great health care in Mexico, believe it or not, but, but you have to pay for it. Mm -hmm. It's a market. Um, the, the, it, and most people don't have access to that stuff. We're going to need to hack the system the same way that Uber and Lyft hacked the taxi mm -hmm. monopoly. I have industrial organization books on my shelf that I, that I studied that use the taxi monopoly as a classic example of a government entrenched cartel that you will never, ever, ever break. And technology did. And of course, now they're coming back and they're trying to destroy Uber and Lyft. But I, I think the innovators and the hackers and, and people that are desperate for an alternative, they're, they're there. And, and we, gotta, we gotta empower them and we also got to let all of these young people that are sort of entranced by democratic socialism see that, that beautiful, positive, oh, well, there's, there's markets helping mm -hmm. people. And isn't that the problem with, I mean, Uber and Lyft were able in the rest of the country to run tests, you know, to run experiments, to see if this would work before it was released nationally. And, and you didn't need the government to change anything. You needed the government to say, hey, this is a new thing and they have a right to exist um, or enforce that right. Yeah. Um, but you don't really need the government on, on things. Um, we've lost the ability, for instance, on healthcare. 
you can't do things. You can't. You can't just say, you know what? We're gonna do. We're gonna do something ourselves. We're gonna do something as the state of Texas. We're gonna do. You can't do that. Um, and so the government just shackles you. And so th- the only ideas you have are theories that no one was allowed to to try yet. You have some small things, and then you have a committee that's looking at them, saying, "Well, is it worth getting rid of this? Because will this work? Will this be better?" And if they have an agenda of one kind of health care or another, you have no chance for 50 separate laboratories. Yeah, we, we just went through this absurd debate, which, which I think turned out right on the question of right to try. Are you, as a terminal patient, allowed to try an experimental drug that, yes. that's gone through, through basic safety tests? Mm-hmm. And on the face of it, it's an absurd question. Like, who would dare tell me that I couldn't? Mm-hmm. Um, and yet we went through that process where, where there's, and by the way, it's, it's, uh, it's a, it's a ugly collusion between the FDA pharmaceutical companies. They don't necessarily want people to have choices. Mm-hmm. They got, they got a system that works for them. Mm-hmm. And one, one of the unintended consequences or intended is that, that a lot of drugs are quite expensive. A lot of drugs that you might want to try, a lot of drugs that are used in Europe aren't available here. And as a patient, I'm thinking to myself, my doctor just told me that I'm going to die. And I'm, I'm a cancer survivor, so this is personal mm-hmm. to me. And my doctor just told me that, but he says that the federal government won't let me try this, this treatment that seems to be working. I can get you into that trial, but you can't do it. So that, to me, like that's a, that's a cool story to explain why patients and doctors making choices is a good thing. Mm-hmm. And that, of course, is the, the, the free market vision is that patients and doctors need to work this stuff out and, and you don't want a politician mm-hmm. or a bureaucrat between you and your doctor. Uh, we produce a lot of stuff on, on medical cannabis for that reason because it's, it's, uh, medical cannabis is something that, that, that very much supported uh, left of center, more and more supported right of center, like in Utah that it just passed mm-hmm. and, and 60, 70% of Republicans supported it as well. But it's not about cannabis at all. It's about whether or not a patient and a doctor can make a choice. And, and can, we see, can we see what happens there? Uh, we did a documentary with, f- about one of my buddies, uh, Joel Davis, mm-hmm. former Tea Party activist, uh, born with horrible scoliosis. And he's, he's had just, just an incredibly uh, sort of painful experience getting through life. His doctor's response over the years was to give him more and more opioids. Mm-hmm. And I forget the number, but it was an insane amount. It was a, it was a, he was taking uh, the amount of opioids every day that would kill anybody else because he had developed a complete tolerance for it. And it was ruining his body. It was ru- ruining his, his, his mind. It was ruining his life. And he decided, with, he lives in West Virginia, so he had to do it illegally. He couldn't really talk to his doctor about it, but he decided, I'm going to wean myself off by using medical cannabis. And he did it. And to me, like, I, I don't know why anyone would tell him he couldn't. That's, that's the story of freedom. And, it, and it's very uplifting and aspirational because he has, he has his life back now. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know why anybody has a right to tell me what I can and cannot put in my body, um, especially if I'm sick. Um, and that includes, I want to die. Yeah. Um, the, the, the sticky part on that comes with the devaluation of life and getting doctors involved. You know, yeah. I don't know if you've seen the numbers. I think it's in Sweden um, that uh, 30%, 30 or 37% of all of the deaths last year in Sweden were doctor assisted. That is a little frightening. Yeah. That's a little frightening because you have incentive as we're seeing in, with Charlie Gard and we've seen it a couple times here in America you know, if the, if, if the doctor deems eh, there's not really anything there, they just shut you off. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they're starting to see that now in Sweden that, oh, this guy is really depressed. Uh, and, uh, you know, he wants to, he wants to uh, you know, end his life. Let's help him because he's a drain anyway. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's a form of uh, fascism, authoritarianism where you – you have this global budget. We're going to spend this much on healthcare, and somebody has decided from the top down 
how much it is. And as you're trying to rearrange the chess pieces, who are humans, our lives, and you're saying, oh, that guy's too old, off. That guy's mentally unstable, gone. Mm -hmm. um, that child's not worth saving. We can't, the cost benefit's just not there. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the brutal calculus of that is, is quite typical in authoritarian countries. But it's also quite typical in, in top-down, one-size-fits-all, global budget, government-run healthcare. Um, so, again, like, I think we're the bad guys that we can't sell that to, mm -hmm. to young people no, because nobody wants, no, nobody believes in that. No right. decent person believes that um, people should die. And I, I go all the way back to the Obamacare fight. I remember Robert Reich infamously saying, we're going to let old people die. And he was, he was speaking, I think he was speaking at Berkeley, and they, and they applauded. Like, how sick is that? Really sick. Yeah. I think we have... I think we are experiencing now a cult, um, you know, a, as I define a cult, a cult is uh, someone, with, a group with extreme ideas out of, out of step with the mainstream, uh, that they will, they will take you, take your children, whoever, and indoctrinate you, yeah. then turn you against anyone who has a differing opinion. Anyone who says this church isn't true well, you got to stop them because they are liars and they're dangerous and you just start building enemies. Well, that's really what's happened to the Democratic Party. They're afraid. You can't step out of the Democratic Party. Um, and they, you know, they, they hold these cult-like meetings. The scary thing is, is they're also a death cult. They, they are, hey, let's, let's light up the you know, Empire State Building and shout our abortion. Wait a minute. It, it used to be safe, rare, legal. It's not rare now. It's not rare. Uh, and they, they are, when you light up the Statue of Liberty to celebrate infanticide, that's a little death cultish, isn't it? I wonder how their coalition holds. Because I, I studied with, with great interest the... Uh, women's March and Indivisible and, and, and how it compared and didn't compare to the Tea Party movement. And you have all of these seemingly disparate values and agendas in, in the Democratic coalition mm -hmm. that, that's showing up mm -hmm. at the march. And of course it fell apart quite quickly because it turned out that, that some of those values were at fundamental odds with others of mm -hmm. those values. And, and whatever else you want to say about the Tea Party, there was a time between 2009 and 2013 where the, the values were almost 100% consistent. You could randomly walk into a crowd, and I did this mm -hmm. all those years. Like, why are you here? What are you, what are you thinking about? And they would all give you some iteration of, uh, I'm here because... Uh, my government has gone bonkers. We need some fiscal responsibility, mm -hmm. constitutionally limited government, and individual liberty. Mm -hmm. and, and by the way, they would have all sorts of opinions about all sorts of other things. Um, but that was the, the glue that held them mm -hmm. together. And the, the modern Democratic Party doesn't have that glue. And, and they have to sort of, I think they have to hide the authoritarian nature of what they're getting at because I don't think that sells. So you, you could, you, you're going to go with populism. You're going to, you're going to put democratic in front of socialism. Um, maybe, maybe you're looking at me saying you're way too optimistic that this doesn't hold together, but, but in order for it to fall apart, like what's the alternative? Where do you go if you believe in liberty and freedom? Where, where does a tea partier that still, doesn't like uh, Wall Street bailouts and, and doesn't like the national debt and doesn't like uh, budgets that never balance and doesn't like uh, uh, limits on free speech. All of that stuff, and I just describe myself, like I'm, I'm drifting out here, I'm trying to find a home. Um, I think you gotta go upstream of politics. I think, I think politics corrupted the Tea Party. I think politics corrupts everything. Mm -hmm. I think eventually, you know, a guy shows up at your doorstep with a deal that you can't refuse in politics. So we got to go upstream into culture and tell stories and, and, 
and 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 connect with that that sort of emotional side of mm-hmm. people that are you know they're they're worried about a lot of the same things we are but they just process things like humans and and I process things like a dork I said something yesterday on the air and it doesn't matter what it was but um I had a friend uh write to me and um and I wasn't in lockstep with him and he was very upset and I'm like Dude, we're, we're, we're never going to be in lockstep. I, that shouldn't be a goal. I know. Why, why all of a sudden are, well, because it was about Donald Trump. Well, because yeah. blah, blah, And uh, um, it, it, you, you don't want to live in that world, yeah. but it seems like that is the world um, that is getting smaller and smaller and smaller that we have to be in, in lockstep. We... we we're much better off if we can look at each other as individuals and say, I don't agree with you on that at all, but, oh, well, you want to go get, you want to go get a shake or you want to go have a drink or whatever. Um, Let's go work on this project together. And I wonder, like, so you look at the Women's March or the the modern democratic coalition and and they're big into silos, right? They, they want to identify people based on the color of their skin or their religion or their, their sexual identity. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's now dozens of silos. It's getting complicated. Mm-hmm. But maybe the alternative is, like, if you really believe in diversity, you should acknowledge that, you know what, there's not dozens of silos. There's millions. There's billions of silos in this world uh, because we're all a little bit different. We all have different hopes and dreams, and our parents are different, and, and our, the faith that we choose is different. Um, but wouldn't life suck if we weren't different? Yes. Like imagine a world that was just me. That, that, that would be the deepest level of hell ever. Horrible. Yeah. It would, it Especially would, you. I, I would hate it. I would hate it. <laughs> I would not want to be around like lots no, of No, neither people. would I. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it is, um, we, we've, we've accentuated our differences uh, at the expense of what, that we need each other. Yeah. You know? Uh, and, and this is an old idea. I mean, the pilgrims tried it. Um, at, at, at Plymouth Rock, they tried it. They, they tried it in Virginia. In, uh, what is it? I want to say Jonestown, but isn't that the... Jamestown. Jamestown. Yeah. <laughs> Jonestown, Jonestown was... was a, but also a socialist. Yeah, but also so- socialist. Yeah. But they, they, they all ended the same way. And the pilgrims had, you know, a very religious reason for doing it. Uh, Jamestown had just a kind of a, a, a big government kind of reasons for doing it, but it, it, but they ended the same way and it does, it just doesn't work. Yeah. It just doesn't work. No matter what your, your motive is, it doesn't work. Um, you, you know, we talk about, uh, uh, who has a big vision. The group of people that should have the big vision are the libertarians, but I find they are exactly like the GOP or the, uh, the DNC, or the socialists, yeah. to where, excuse me, if you don't quote the right French uh, philosopher, you're no libertarian. Where libertarians, the, I mean, the reason what, why it appeals to me is because it, it was kind of the original idea of the country. Just don't, as your book was, you know, don't, uh, what, don't, don't hurt people. And don't, don't take their stuff. Yeah, don't take their stuff. Uh, that's really what it, it's supposed to be. Yeah. It's not really, yeah. is it? Well, it's, um, no, it's not. And there's, there's an interesting civil war going on within the Libertarian Party. And, and we love to chase each other out right. of the tent. Yeah. But right now there's a, there's a proxy war for this whole cultural identity thing going on between socially conservative libertarians, and there's a ton of them, and socially liberal libertarians. And, and I, I think they're... Mis- How can you be a libertarian on either side if you want to tell the other side how to live? That's what I'm trying to tell them. <laughs> right. I mean, it's, that doesn't make sense. They're, they're missing, like, the... The, the point. The, the sales pitch <laughs> for being a libertarian is, I'm going to let you live your life, and you're socially conservative. You think that marriage is between a man and a woman... And you want to raise your kids going to this church. And, and by the way, you probably don't want to bake a cake for that couple. And I'm like, that's okay. You should do that. 
And here I am. I want to go to Grateful Dead concerts, and, and I want to dye my hair blue and, and, and do all sorts of things that, that probably sort of rub you the wrong way. But in America, in a small L libertarian world, we're both free to do that. And in the process, we're going to probably figure out how to cooperate, how to collaborate, how to tolerate each other. We might even get to the point where we could respect each other's mm-hmm. point of view, but we're never going to be the same. You're never going to convince me to live just like you. So we're in this, in this argument. I, I spent the last couple of years attending uh, Big L libertarian events for the first time in my life. And, and they're, they're working through some of these things. A lot of good people, mm-hmm. a lot of great people, a lot mm-hmm. of great candidates. Um, but, you know, it's a little bit like a, an article in the New York Times I read a couple of years ago where Bernie's old socialist buddies from Burlington, mm-hmm. they think he's a total sellout mm-hmm. because he no longer talks about seizing the means of production. Mm-hmm. And, and they're, they're deeply disappointed that Bernie Sanders is successful. That's what small ideological based movements do. They're pushing people out. Mm-hmm. Um, the growing pains for the Libertarian Party or any other third party, maybe it's just the Independent Party, is it's got to be it's got to be like what I was describing with the Tea Party. There's a couple of values that are non-negotiable. Fiscal responsibility and constitutionally limited government. Beyond that, um, we got all sorts of people with all sorts of views and, and all sorts of religions and everything else. And, and we cooperate. We're this beautiful, crazy quilt of all sorts of different types of people. That's what the, that's what the LP has to become if they want to succeed. That's what... I mean, that's why I'm here. I think that's, that's sort of uh, the vision that, that you and the powers that be have for Blaze TV. Like, it's a, it's a place where we're going to agree on a couple things that are really important to us. Do you believe in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights? Do you believe America hasn't always been, but is uh, the biggest force for good because of the free market system? I mean, if you believe those things, man, I don't care about anything else. Yeah. Just, I mean, because those two things tell me you're not trying to change the fundamental system and you believe in these rights that are sacrosanct. What else is there to argue about that matters? Yeah. Really? There's not much. And so we're having a little social experiment right here and so far nobody's died. And no. <laughs> so, so were the founders libertarians? I mean, was that how they would, would describe themselves today? Yes, and, and they wouldn't know that word. Right, right, right. They would, they would call themselves... Classical liberals. Classical liberals are just um, Scottish Enlightenment types. Yeah. I don't know what the... They, I guess they would use the word Republican. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what Jefferson would call it. Uh, but it was very much a, a, a libertarian vision uh, with a healthy dose of, of radical democracy in there. You know, and, and they, they argued about how much they would empower people to, to govern themselves. But in the context of everything else that had happened before them, that, that was a radical idea that, that individuals actually mattered and that they could be trusted to govern themselves. So it, it probably is, I've never thought about this before, but it's probably some flavor of, of libertarian populism. Mm-hmm. They're raging against the machine, right? Mm-hmm. They're raging against the king. They have this, this very high-minded a vision of, of all people uh, self-governing. They didn't get slavery right. Um, we eventually got that right. But the vision and the context of where they were at the time, which is so radical, pie in the sky, unicorns. Um, so when I, when I think about what they did, I think, I think we might be able to fix our problem. Yeah. Theirs was bigger. Yeah. And... As far as I know, the king's not going to behead us, at least not yet. Not yet. Yeah. Uh, let me go uh, one more place. From the founders being libertarians. You're a deadhead. The Grateful Dead have all of the earmarks of libertarians. Yeah. I mean, they, hey, look, it's our music. You're having fun. You know, bring your recorder, but plug in down here. Just take, get a good clean copy of it. Yeah. You know, they're creating, they charged you. They saw what people were doing. They enabled them to do it. Didn't try to chase them out. Uh, and they became the grateful dead because of that. Do your own thing. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, it was a, it was a, and I, I've, I've told you this before. I, I modeled uh, to the extent that I had any influence over the organization of the Tea Party. I wanted it to be leaderless, and I would always refuse to tell people what to do. I would always say, "You guys, you guys figure it out," um, because the power in this movement comes from the bottom up. Mm-hmm. And and go back and watch uh, recently. There's a, a was it Netflix or Amazon? I think it was an Amazon three or four part series called A Long Strange Trip. It's about the, the evolution of the Grateful Dead. And I'd, there were some interviews in there from Jerry Garcia that I'd never seen before. And he was basically an anarcho-capitalist. He was, he was an anarchist in the sense that he refused to tell his community what to do. Mm-hmm. And, and the result of that meant that it was always sort of chaos. It was beautiful chaos. It was super messy. Uh, things didn't always work out right, but the upside was a tremendously large, sustainable, beautiful community that that had sort of self ownership in in defending mm-hmm. the brand of the community. Mm-hmm. Um, that to me is what is what America should be. I don't want to be told what to do, mm-hmm. and I, I suspect that for all of our problems as individuals and and all of, all of our failings, um, we could create something more beautiful by being free than we would ever do by having a leader. Let's have, what, Jerry, tell us what to do. Mm-hmm. It's like, no, I'm not gonna tell you what to do. Mm-hmm. Almost, this, this will upset people, but he's, he's sort of like a Washingtonian sort of figure. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna be a king here. And if you make me, I'm gonna stop. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, there's that thing, and it was a very American thing. And I think that's what the difference between the Tea Party and the 912 Project was in the end. There was a few set of principles, no leaders, all local leaders. Yeah. And the Tea Party had no leaders at the beginning. And as it went on and on and on, it started to coalesce around some voices. And, and I fought back and forth on, with myself. This is not going to last because it's not, there is no leadership. Um, however, I, there are nine twelve projects still around. They're doing different things. All of them are doing different things. Yeah. But it is it is a sense of community and um and 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 guarding your own community. Right. You know, this is who we are. And this is how we interpret it. The the best ones, and I and I still speak to Tea Party groups occasionally. The the ones that are still robust have gotten away from politics and focused on, on local stuff. Mm-hmm. And maybe it's local politics, maybe it's mm-hmm. a school board, um, but things that matter specifically to them and their neighbors, um, it might be you know, public works projects, charity type stuff that they're mm-hmm. doing. And, and if you had it all to do over again, and, and of course nobody engineered this, it emerged spontaneously and it, it gravitated immediately towards, we need to elect, these people, mm-hmm. and those, those, some of those people jumped up on stage and, and, and said, you know, I'll name names, like people like Sarah Palin, she, she saw an opportunity, she mm-hmm. jumped up on stage, and she said, follow me. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that was the beginning of the end. And pretty soon we had a slate of candidates, and pretty mm-hmm. soon we were defending yeah. the Republican Congress, and, and that's when, when all of the the, the clash between defending the values, which, which are clear and pure, mm-hmm. versus the political expediency of just getting down the road, mm-hmm. that, that ultimately tore it apart. Yeah, at the beginning when it was pure values. Look, we're standing up because we believe these things. Yeah. Um, and it was in the hands of the people. It was, it was magical. Magical. You know. It was like a Grateful Dead concert. It was. It was. There was uh, without all the drugs and yeah, without the drugs and yeah. the and the grilled cheese sandwiches, right? <laughs> and the tie dyes, because um, everyone everyone had probably American flag T shirts on instead. Yeah. But I still remember um, those those early massive gatherings mm-hmm. where the the park police and and all of the planners that manage crowds to make sure that nobody gets hurt. Mm-hmm. Um, they had no idea what was coming and they were caught flat footed. And, you know, as a result that the metros shut down and there was, there was no crowd control. There was no safety 
barricades. There were no porta potties. And everyone just kept saying, please and thank you. Mm-hmm. They didn't burn anything. Mm-hmm. They didn't leave it a mess. Because the, the rules were there. That they, they, no one need, needed to, to, to come in Jerry Garcia style and say, I'm in charge. Here's how you guys have to behave. They mm-hmm. knew how to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, it came from the bottom up. Mm-hmm. Um, that, and they believed in uh, restoration, not destruction. Yeah. And of course, you don't see that. No. With the most remarkable thing is having 500,000 people on the mall that we did on 828 and yeah. to what, 2010. And uh, I saw that mall before and I saw it afterwards. And it was cleaner after everybody left. There yeah. wasn't a scrap. People brought their own trash bags. That boggled my mind. They brought their own trash bags yeah. and just cleaned up all the trash and just neatly put them over by the garbage cans. It was insane. So you want a, you want a real-time experiment of what free people do without being told to clean them all, mm-hmm. without being told not to punch their neighbors or set cars on fire. Mm-hmm. Um, their rules were better than any set of rules you could have come up with. Oh, yeah. And, and they wouldn't have done it. Yeah. Had I said, and we've got to clean up the mall, and we've got to have a committee to, the people would have done it begrudgingly. Some people would have done it, but this was just spontaneous. Right. Yeah. The, the next iteration, Tea Party 2.0, is probably not a big gathering on the mall. It's, it's probably going to be some sort of uh, digital gathering where people who are, you know, I call them liberty curious. They're, they're sort of uncomfortable with the choices they have right now, and they're, and they're, they're seeking, uh, particularly young people, they're going to YouTube and they're curating a mm-hmm. curriculum for themselves because they know. And, and, and maybe it's Jordan Peterson. Uh, maybe, it's, maybe it's a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of the other. Um, they're looking for an alternative, and I think they, they're going to create that for themselves. Mm-hmm. They're, they're going to create that community there's a great Harvard uh, Divinity School study about how it is that young people are, are crowdsourcing a sense of community by joining a church or joining CrossFit mm-hmm. or whatever it is. They, they want that sense of community and actually use technology in a, in a constructive way, unlike the way that, that Facebook and Twitter tear us yeah. apart. It's human nature. It's, we want to belong. Yeah. We want to belong and belong to each other. So, Matt. As always, thank you. Thank you.